Welcome AP Chemistry students to Unit 5 Kinetics, how fast a reaction occurs. Today we will be talking about collision theory and instantaneous rate law. Chemical kinetics is all about how quickly our reactants form products. Do they form products very swiftly, resulting in a very steep curve? or are they very slow? So it's all about reaction rates. Rates is simply a change in something over time, right? Like when you get in a taxi, the rate is how much money you spend over the certain amount of time you're in that car. That's their rate, right? So for chemistry, the rate of a reaction is a change normally in concentration, so the molarity, for each unit of time, which in most chemical reactions will measure in seconds. So in chemistry, our rates will always be expressed as a change, and we symbolize change with the Greek letter delta, in concentration. And you can abbreviate concentration as brackets. So by putting brackets and then some reactant, this is writing the change in the concentration of the reactants for some unit of time. Seconds, minutes, most of the time in this class we'll be talking in seconds. So you'll often see us write this expression when talking about the rate of a reaction. How much is something changing for some unit of time? So in this graph we can see that something is disappearing and something is appearing. If it's a reaction, reactants get used up. So this red line is showing our reactants. And since we are losing reactants as they collide with one another to form products, the rate of a reactant is normally negative. So a negative change in concentration over time. While products are typically appearing. So the change in concentration of our products is typically positive. And unfortunately, this is something that has to be done experimentally, meaning I will often give you data or we will be doing a number of labs in here to look at the reaction rate, how quickly our reactants form products. So that video we saw at the beginning of the lecture talked about how to speed up or slow down a reaction's rate. So just to recap, we can change how quickly a reaction occurs by changing the reactants. Some elements, some reactants are way more reactive than others, so changing the reactants themselves can speed up or slow down a reaction. The video started, however, by talking about how changing the concentration of reactants changes the speed at which a reaction occurs. In order for these two reactants to react, they have to collide with one another. So having more of them in solution means there's a greater chance that they will collide with sufficient energy and in the correct orientation to form a product. So increasing concentration can speed up the rate of a reaction. We can also break up any solids. When you have a solid, only the exterior of that solid has places where collisions can occur. So by breaking it up, we increase the surface area and now there's more spaces for a collision to occur and greater chance that those collisions will form products. The video also talked about changing temperature. Generally speaking, an increase of 10 degrees will double the speed of a reaction. Increasing the temperature makes your reactants move faster. In order for reactants to form products, they have to collide with one another in the correct orientation and with enough energy. One of the big takeaways is that in order for two reactants to react, they have to collide in the correct orientation. In order for this nitric oxide and ozone to react, this oxygen has to collide with this nitrogen and overcome its intramolecular forces to form nitrogen dioxide. If the nitrogen and oxygen do not collide in the correct orientation, they cannot form that bond. And they have to collide with enough energy. They have to be moving at just the right speed in order to overcome the attraction between these two oxygens and convert that kinetic energy into a bonding energy for the nitrogen and oxygen to form that bond. 
So in order for a reaction to occur, reactants have to collide in the correct orientation and with enough energy. That is absolutely critical to every explanation in the upcoming unit. One thing that can help with the orientation of your reactants is a catalyst. A catalyst lowers the activation energy by providing an additional pathway. You should always put the word catalyst and activation energy together in your brain. If you see a question that talks about a catalyst, you are going to have to talk about activation energy in some form or fashion. On a deeper note, catalysts often orient your reactants in such a way that they collide better. Organic catalysts like enzymes hold your substrates in place so that they can collide in the correct orientation. That is not always chemically true. For example, platinum causing water to form hydrogen peroxide is not a orientation, it just simply provides an additional pathway, a mechanism. And at the end of this unit, we'll talk more about mechanisms, but for right now, just know, activation energy and catalyst always go together. The AP exam will try to trick you into thinking other things can speed up or slow down a reaction. So here are things to look out for that do not affect the rate of a reaction. If I'm working with a gas system and I insert more gas, you might be tempted to think that that gas is going to affect the concentration in some way, but keep in mind gases are mostly empty spaces. So I'm working with a gas reaction and it says, oh, what happens if we pump in extra argon or an inert re reactant? Inert means unreactive and therefore it's going to have no effect. So please do not fall for that trick. Ultimately, the only thing that will speed up or slow down a reaction is something that causes your reactants to collide in the correct orientation and with enough energy. The amount of energy necessary to overcome those intramolecular forces is known as the activation energy. So in order for my two reactants to collide and form my products, they have to collide in the correct orientation and with enough energy to overcome the activation energy to form those products. If they don't, they stay reactants. So on a potential energy diagram, when we show reactants forming products, you see this giant hump in the middle. That giant hump is simply noting how much energy my two reactants have to have when they collide with one another to form products. If they do not have that energy, if they don't have the activation energy, they go on to be reactants. This is often represented on a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. A Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution shows all the particles and then labels where the activation energy is on the x-axis. On the x-axis, we he see here that activation energy is this line right here, meaning only the, particles to, only the particles to the right of that line have enough energy to form products. So while all the particles on the left side here are in the reaction, only the particles on the right side are going to form products. What Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions often show multiple reactions. And you're asked a couple questions about them, but one of the most traditional ones is, here are two Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions. Which one shows the higher temperature, and how do you know that? Well, temperature one might look like it has a higher value, but keep in mind what that value represents. It's the number of particles. And while temperature one has many particles at this very high value here, that's actually a low amount of energy. So temperature one is actually cooler than temperature two. One of the ways we can note this is if you look at temperature two, temperature two has more particles after the activation energy, meaning temperature two has to be warmer because these particles have enough energy to overcome the activation energy. Another way this question might be asked is which of, which of these two systems, T1 or T2, will form more products? T2 will form more products because it's a greater area under the curve after the activation energy. So again, on a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, activation energy is on the x-axis and will be labeled 
you have to make answers based on those distributions under the curve for each one, noting where the activation energy is. How quickly a reactant is used up or how quickly a, rea a product appears changes as the reaction occurs. As a reaction occurs, more and more of your reactants are used up and when they're gone, they're no longer able to react. <coughs> Therefore, the rate of a reaction slows down as more and more reactants are used up. In the reaction here, nitrogen dioxide is a reactant and it's forming two products, oxygen gas and nitric oxide. How do I know that those were the reactants and products? Nitrogen dioxide is disappearing while oxygen and nitric oxide are appearing. Notice that the curves level out over time. Eventually, they will go flat when we reach equilibrium, which is our next unit. The rate at which these appear is going to change as the reaction occurs. Typically in this unit, we will focus on the instant of mixing. At time zero, how quickly are they going to change? But over the course of the reaction, we can actually find the rate by doing some simple algebra. You can find the instantaneous rate of a reaction by taking a tangent off of that line and doing simple algebra of rise over run. The slope of that tangent line at the instant you're looking at can be used to talk about the rate of the reaction. So again, instantaneous rate is determined by taking a tangent of that line. So example one says, what is the rate of reactant, uh, what is the rate of reaction for the reactants at 10 and 20 seconds? If we take the tangent of the line at 10 seconds, we can find that by doing some simple algebra. The rise here seems to be about 15. The run is approximately, let's say, let's call it seven. So a negative 15 over seven for 10 seconds. At 20 seconds, we've got a rise of 20 and a run of, let's call it 25. So a slope of something like, let's say, a negative four fifths or 0.8 for 20 seconds. That's fairly straightforward. Again, they are both negative values because our reactants are being used up. Products, products are appearing. So for the next two, we're going to find a positive slope. So I draw a tangent line for the 10 seconds. So let's call that a rise of 40 and a run of 25. or eight fifths, while at 20 seconds, we see a rise of 20 and a run of let's say 22, so 10 elevenths. At the instant of mixing, we can find the relative rate of a reaction just from the balanced equation. The relative rate of a reaction is based on those stoichiometric coefficients. From our example before of nitrogen dioxide making oxygen and nitrogen monoxide, we can talk about at the instant of mixing, how swiftly will the nitrogen dioxide decompose and form oxygen? How fast are they relative to one another? By writing what's known as the relative rate. This is simply done by putting a one over all the coefficients. Relative to one another, nitrogen dioxide is going to disappear twice as fast as oxygen. So the rate of that would be a negative one half to oxygen's one. But it's going to be the same as the rate at which nitrogen monoxide appears. So the instantaneous rate we could express as a whole number value 
by finding the common denominator. In this case, two. If I multiply everything here by two, the twos cancel out, and I can find the initial rate relative to one another. It's a negative one to two to one. We're gonna jump around a little bit, so let's do exercise three first. Exercise three in your packet has us write the relative rate of change. So, the initial rate at the moment of mixing would be one over two of the change of nitrogen, nitrosyl chloride over some unit or change in time. And it's going to be negative as that is a reactant. That's gonna equal a positive change in nitrogen monoxide's concentration over two times that change in time, which would equal a change in chlorine gas's concentration over the change in time. To write this as to write this as a whole number ratio, two, two, and one, if we multiply the entire equation by two, we can get that the initial rate or the relative rate is going to be a negative one, negative one to one to two. So let's practice this. Here is phosphorus trihydride forming phosphorus and hydrogen gas. What is the initial relative rate for each one? And then express it as a whole number value. So remember, rate law is always gonna be a change in the concentration of something over a unit of time. So using this setup, why don't you pause the video and see if you can write the relative rate law, the initial rate, by saying the change in the concentration of something over just, let's use T for time, or you can put seconds, but using the stoichiometric coefficients here, and whether it's positive or negative, let's see if you can write the initial rate for each one. So pause the video and write the initial rate. Hopefully you were able to get, that would be a negative one fourth to one to a positive one sixth. To express it as a whole number ratio, we can multiply the entire equation by 12. If I multiply by 12, four becomes three, one is 12 and six becomes two. So our rate, our relative rates to one another are a negative three to 12 to two. With that being said, we are done with unit 5.1. Next time we will talk about rate laws the and go into differential rate law. I will see you next time.